Right, oh, welcome back friends to the concluding video of this discussion. I promise you that this is the last video in our discussion on the matter of the Delhi Laws Act. In Re Delhi Laws Act decided by the Supreme Court of India on the 23rd of May 1951 telling us, informing us, educating us about the validity of delegated legislation. I feel that we have spent sufficient time on this, uh, on this particular matter. Although we could spend countless hours more, it really is that absorbing and that fascinating. And there have been some brilliant opinions written in this particular matter. The problem for us, of course, the problem that the president as well faced was that each of the uh, seven judges did write an opinion. There were seven different opinions. So you might say that the president found himself in the same position that almost all of us do. When we go out seeking some advice, we get seven opinions from seven different people. That is basically what happened with the president in this particular matter. Is delegated legislation valid? If it is valid, are there any limits and restrictions on it? If it is not valid, then well, then the parliament is in trouble because that just increases their workload. But anyway, we have ended our previous video on this slide. Cleavage of the judicial opinion. Uh, five of the judges agreed on these three things that the Delhi Laws Act section which called for delegated legislation was valid. The Ajmer Mirwada Extension of Laws Act section was also valid and the first part of the Part C States Laws Act was also valid. There was a further division of opinion on the other hand on the second part of section 2 of the Part C States Laws Act 1950 which was held to be invalid which was held to be ultra virus by a 4-3 majority and note that it is still the slimmest possible majority uh, just one opinion on the others in the other direction and even that would have been held valid but personally I uh, respectfully and humbly do not disagree with this uh, particular opinion with these opinions with these majorities i am very much in agreement of them we are of course not going to discuss all of these seven opinions but if you are interested i would strongly urge you to try and read them there are a significant uh, number of precedents which have been discussed by each of the judges and some of the case law that has been cited is really informative and really helps us understand how governments work and um, how how judiciary works as well but i must warn you those are very lengthy judgments and it would take some time to go through all of them which you might have guessed by the gap between our various videos i've really ne needed to go through each of the judgments several times and i have finally concluded that we should follow justice fazal ali's just judgment now, Justice Sayyid Fazal Ali has dissented on many of the cases that we have already discussed. And on at least one occasion that I recall, I have disagreed with his dissent as well. Once again, humbly and respectfully and as a student and not as a critic. Uh, but nonetheless, it has been uh, easy to observe that he tended to be the rebel amongst our uh, seven judges. And in the federal court decision, which kind of spurred the president to seek the advice of the Supreme Court in this particular situation, in that federal court case, Jatindranath versus the state of uh, Bihar, 1949, even in that case, he was the one who stated that delegated legislation is valid, while the other four judges of the federal court uh, opined that delegated legislation is invalid. These five judges and two further additions, of course, were all on the bench that heard the In Re Delhi Laws Act case. And therefore, uh, you would expect the matter to be along the same lines. But by now, the situation had changed and the leader of that change happened to be Justice Fazal Ali. And his opinion then is what I'm going to concentrate on, largely because he has gone about concluding 
whatever we all agree he has gone about concluding that in a very brilliant manner he starts off by saying that if the question is can the legislature delegate legislative functions there are three possible answers not just two not just yes or no the answers are yes a sovereign legislature being sovereign has unlimited powers including the unlimited powers of delegation answer two possibly if not the first one then delegated legislation is permissible but within certain limits it is not unlimited uh, <clears throat> the power of delegation contains or comes with certain restrictions those are the first two possible answers and the possible answer number three is the simplest of them all no delegated legislation is not permissible at all and justice fazal ali continues in that vein by focusing on that third answer he says that if we disprove this answer if we disprove the third answer if we say that delegated legislation is not possible at all is not permissible at all is an incorrect statement how will we go about proving that first of all what would be the situations in which we can prove that dele delegated legislation is not permissible at all and he comes up with two possible um, two possible statements that can back this particular notion if we want to um, if we want to assert that delegated legislation is not permissible at all it can be on the basis of only these two uh, pillars one might call them they are the first one being this latin maxim delegatus non potest delegare we will discuss this in detail and the second one which we have already discussed in detail the notion of separation of powers if these two are completely inviolable then obviously delegated legislation cannot be allowed if however these two themselves are not always valid then perhaps delegated legislation is after all permissible so first let's start with that latin maxim delegatus non potest delegare it translates uh, rather loosely rather than literally to a delegated authority cannot be redelegated an authority which has been delegated a power which has come to you via delegation cannot be further delegated to somebody else this maxim comes to us from uh, contract law uh, basically in that branch of contract law which deals with agency and auctions and insolvency and any other such fiduciary matters where if you are uh, given the responsibility to do certain things you cannot pass on that responsibility to somebody else because the responsibility has been given to you based on your characteristics based on certain qualities or qualifications that you possess you cannot then further delegate them on this was the maxim that was attempted to um, attempted as uh, as as basically a way of ensuring that delegated legislation cannot happen what is being attempted to be said here is that if you yourself have been given this responsibility to perform legislation to enact laws to legislate and you have been given this responsibility by a different authority then how can you further pass it on to somebody else you have that authority because you have certain qualifications because you have certain qualities even then you cannot be allowed to pass on that responsibility to somebody else that is how the attempt was made to justify the notion that delegated legislation is not permissible and uh, to break it up somebody gave the legislate uh, the legislature the authority to legislate who gave that legislature that authority according to those who hold, uphold this maxim they claim that that authority was given by somebody else somebody more uh, superior in the case of the indian parliament you might say that the constitution of india gives that authority or to be more abstract and perhaps at the same time more accurate we the people have given the authority to parliament to make laws on our behalf that is the claim being made 
Unfortunately, that is not the case as was proved for the first time in this very old case uh, decided by the Calcutta High Court on the 26th of March 1877. Yes, Calcutta High Court is that old. Yes, it was part of British India and it had to rule on this case Regina versus Burra. Reg is short for Regina, the Latin word for Queen. The Queen happened to be the sovereign of British India at that time, Queen Victoria, of course. Uh, if it had been one of the kings, let's say George VI, for example, everybody knows him because of the king's speech, I feel. If this case had happened during his reign, the case uh, title would have been Rex versus uh, Burra. This gentleman Burra happened to be uh, happened to have uh, committed an offense, happened to have committed the offense, I should say. He was uh, convicted of committing murder. And the uh, situation was that the, uh, the sentence was then commuted to transportation for life. And that commutation was under a delegated legislation. And then that is how that particular matter went to the courts about should delegated legislation be allowed that delegation had been taken uh, had taken place under the powers of the governor general at that time and the um, enactment had originally been made by the british parliament and it was then argued successfully before the calcutta high court that Although the British Parliament had created the legal uh, structure over here in British India, including the legislature which performed the act of delegation, nonetheless, that particular um, Indian legislation, which really was just the Governor General and his uh, and his councillors, they nonetheless were sovereign in their sphere. They nonetheless uh, were not. Uh, were were not restricted in their in their duties in their authorities in their particular jurisdiction that was the argument that was successfully made before the calcutta high court nonetheless it went further into appeal to the privy council and the privy council upheld what the calcutta high court had uh, had ruled that the maxim delegatus non potest delegare should not be applicable in administrative law, should be restricted to contract law and even then only to those specific parts of, uh, of contract law. And uh, Reg versus, uh, Regina versus Burra is a very, very important case in common law in general it, because it was um, decided upon by the Privy Council. Every jurisdiction which uh, came under the Privy Council's authority under its jurisdiction all of them follow this particular case which is why you see it quoted even in australia and canada and also in the united states and of course right here in india in fact this is just one of the several cases more than a dozen precedents have been cited by our uh, seven judges in in this particular delhi laws act matter it is a very brilliant uh, piece of, of adjudication. The judges have uh, written some very readable opinions. Unfortunately, it's just too time consuming perhaps for everyone. Uh, and, um, as you may have noted from the duration that has elapsed between this video and the one that came before it, it took a while to read and analyze all of them and several of them had to be read several times, especially Justice Fazal Ali's judgment, which we are ultimately relying on. Nonetheless, point is, I would urge you to go through those opinions if that is a field of special interest for you. The uh, overall opinions in the Delhi Laws Act are basically a very good book on delegated legislation and its restrictions, etc. Anyway, even if the maxim that had been repelled in uh, Regina versus Bura, even if that maxim had applied, had not been repelled, even then we should recall that parliament is not actually a delegate of we the people. Yes, we elect members of the parliament, but we have not created parliament. We have uh, written the constitution which has created the parliament. Uh, 
it is the constitution from which the parliament derives its authority to legislate if we had delegated this authority to the parliament then it would follow that we could take back we could withdraw this power from parliament and as you are aware we cannot do that there is nothing we can do which says which results in the parliament losing its power to legislate uh, parliament you one might argue these days is busy losing its powers anyway on its own but it is definitely not because we the people are taking back that power are withdrawing uh, from parliament its power to legislate which would have been the case if indeed we had delegated to it the power to legislate but we have not delegated to it that power is inherent in parliament and that is why this maxim delegatus non potest delegare does not apply over here so if you want to prove that delegated legislation is not valid then one of the two ways you could have proved it is out of the picture delegatus non potest delegare is not applicable what is the second way you could prove that it is invalid it is that old discussion we have already had which is about separation of powers and we have already discussed that separation of powers is not strictly followed definitely not strictly followed in india which uh, follows which adheres to the westminster form of government wherein the executive which is basically the council of ministers is actually a subset of the legislature it is not separated it is not distinct from the legislature in the united states on the other hand the opposite applies a member of the us cabinet cannot be a part of the us legislature which is the house of uh, i beg of pardon the house of representatives and the senate i was about to say house of commons so the house of representatives and the senate um its members cannot become cabinet officers cannot become cabinet secretaries or cabinet ministers these uh, cabinet members are appointed by the president and they are answerable they serve at the pleasure of the president they are answerable only to the chief executive and not to uh, not to the house of representatives as is the case in our country in in our um, polity where the cabinet the council of ministers is actually responsible to the lok sabha that is not the case in the united states where separation of powers is more strictly adhered but even then even in the united states delegated legislation has not been found to be invalid and not just in the us but also in australia where the constitution itself talks about uh, the separation of powers uh, distinctly specifically even there delegated legislation has not been found to be invalid although separation of powers exists let's look at one particular opinion of the us supreme court a celebrated opinion from a celebrated judge justice oliver wendell holmes opined in springer versus the government of philippine islands however we may disguise it by veiling words we do not and cannot carry out the distinction between legislative and executive action with mathematical precision and divide the branches into two watertight compartments were it ever so desirable to do so which i am far from believing that it is or that the constitution requires justice oliver wendell holmes is basically saying that we may love to disguise by our words that we should separate legislative action and executive action but no matter how hard we try we cannot perform this distinction with mathematical precision we cannot divide these branches into watertight compartments if at all it was desirable to do so and according to me according to justice holmes that is it is not desirable to do so not nor does the constitution require us to do so so even in the one jurisdiction where separation of powers is uh, held as close as a dogma can be held even there this has not resulted in strict separation of powers so why should we here in india where anyway separation of powers is not essential uh, 
where checks and balances is more important than separation of powers, then why should we restrict ourselves using that dogma? And thus, both those uh, arguments that could have uh, resulted in the conclusion that delegated legislation is not permissible, both those arguments fail, which means if the question is can a legislator delegate legislative functions, then the answer can be one of two only, one of these first two. The third is out of the question. The answer therefore is delegated legislation is permissible and what is left to decide is are there any restrictions on delegated legislation or is it unrestricted, is it unlimited. Does the parliament or any legislature have unlimited powers of delegating its legislative functions? And this can be answered by referring to a different opinion. Justice uh, Fazal Ali, uh, the, the perpetual rebel, let's call him, he believed that there are no restrictions on the powers of delegation. And uh, four out of his six brother judges refused to agree with him. And those four, therefore, hold the opinion on the second part of that section two of the uh, Part C States Laws Act. The, these four judges, and we will refer to Justice Mahajan, just, um, Justice Mahajan's opinion, they concluded that there are certain limits. Justice uh, Mahajan's opinion is being considered because Chief Justice uh, Kanya actually believed that delegated legislation itself is not possible. So he never got into discussing on the limits of delegation. According to him, delegation is invalid. So the question of, de of limits does not arise. Justice Mahajan, on the, the, on the other hand, believed that there are certain, uh, certain restrictions, certain limits on delegated legislation. And he uh, tries to explain what those limits should be. Basically, the delegation should not amount to an abdication of responsibility. We always talk about the powers of parliament to legislate, but we fail to realize that it is also actually the duty of parliament to legislate. The whole purpose of parliament is to make laws. It cannot give up this duty. It cannot abdicate this responsibility. If, on the other hand, through some uh, act of delegation, through some action of delegation, I should say, to avoid confusion, through some action of delegation, it appears or it results into uh, the fact that it has actually abdicated its responsibility to, to, to legislate. That is one particular uh, restriction on delegated legislation. And the second restriction uh, that the judges opined on is that the delegation should not create a parallel legislature. There should still remain only one legislative authority which has given one particular part of its authority to a certain other body, usually the executive, in such a way that it can take back that authority. It has not given it in perpetuity. It can easily be withdrawn. And that is the golden mean as far as delegation is concerned. That the delegation is allowed as long as it doesn't amount to an abdication of responsibility, to a shirking of responsibility, to a shirking of duties. And it should not result in a new legislation being, a new legislature being created. Those are the two restrictions. This can be easily observed when we read that section 2 again, section 2 of the Part C States Laws Act 1950, the first part uh, that is all but the last three lines of this particular section. That first part is very similar to the section 7 of the Delhi Laws Act and Section 2 of the Ajmer Merwada Extension of Laws Act. But the last part and provision may be made, I am reading the last three lines, and provision may be made in any enactment so extended for the repeal or amendment of any corresponding law which is for the time being applicable to that Part C state. The first part of this section said that 
the central government can extend to a part c state any enactment which is in force in a part c part a state okay so a part a state legislation can be adopted to a part c state by the central government the second portion of this section states that while adopting such a part a legislation while extending such a part a legislation to any part c state the central government can also if required repeal any legislation which is already in force in part c or uh, amend any legislation which is already in force in that part c state basically what it is saying is supposing there is a law already in force in your particular part c state and that law clashes with this other legislation that you are extending to that part c state then to eliminate that clash for example you can simply repeal that existing law or you can modify that existing law now this is exactly what is feared by our four judges when they are saying that the legis the delegation of the legislation should not amount to the creation of a parallel legislature and that is exactly what is happening over here the power to amend and repeal can only be exercised by an authority that has the power to enact laws the central government the executive does not have the power to enact laws it has the power and the duty to execute laws not to make laws so it cannot therefore repeal or amend the laws which is why the second part of the section 2 of the part c states laws act 1950 is therefore ultra virus the parliament the parliament having been the originator of the laws um that have been delegated so that was the distinction that was noted by by our judges that as long as the delegation does not amount to a abdication of responsibility and b creation of a parallel legislation these two restrictions were not being violated by section 7 of the delhi laws act so that delegation was valid was not being validated by section 2 of the ajmer mirwara extension of laws act so that was also a valid delegation of legislation it was not being validated by the first few sentences the first portion the first part of section 2 of the part c states laws act 1950 but it was being violated where these words appear repeal and amendment of an existing law it should be noted that this was the only enactment of the three that were being discussed this was the only one that had been written in independent republican india which was a bad sign wasn't it none of the british made laws actually had crossed this particular rubicon none of them were found to be ultra virus it was the law that our parliament had written which our supreme court found to have crossed the restrictions nonetheless not the first time that has happened not the last time that has happened either so that concludes our discussion on the validity of delegated legislation the conclusion being that yes delegated legislation is valid but there are certain restrictions and those restrictions basically uh, prevent the creation of a parallel legislature or the abdication of the duties of the original legislation so i hope that this has been reasonably coherent and i hope that you will continue to like and subscribe to the channel next time we will look at another interesting and fascinating uh, judgment of the supreme court of india as we continue on our journey of discovering its entire history hope you join me then see you bye bye